The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Hiya, Tony. Oh, okay, Ethelbert. Uh, what's doing? Not much. We're just waiting. Oh, waiting for what? Waiting for you to say those wonderful words. Oh, you mean about Anchor Hawking being the most famous name in glass? Well, not going to say them. And why not? Well, because I think the Anchor Hawking people would rather have me remind everybody that the March of Dimes begins today. Say, that's right. And I hope that everybody wants to be in step with that famous march. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, The Miracle. Late afternoon, the richly furnished master bedroom of an imposing mansion. Beside a great canopied bed stand a handsome, dark-haired young woman and a deferential, quietly dressed young man. In the bed itself lies an older man, gray-faced and wrinkled, in whose sunken eyes lie pain and fear. In a voice that quavers with weakness, he says, Shouldn't that doctor be here by this time? It's less than half an hour since Mr. Weldon telephoned him, Father. Less than half an hour. That means nothing to you, Marion. You have years of life ahead of you. The doctors say I have only a few months at most. Weldon, you really believe this new doctor can save me? Dr. Von Telberg has accomplished some remarkable cures, Mr. Blaine. I have great faith in him. I should have sent for him weeks ago instead of only today. Marion, it was your fault I didn't. I don't share your secretary's faith in this Dr. Von Telberg, Father. As I've told you before, other medical men consider him a charlatan. Other medical men are envious of his success, Miss Blaine. What success, Mr. Weldon? The man runs a tiny private hospital where he claims to cure diseases that reputable physicians pronounce incurable. And according to my information, he hasn't proved a single one of his claims. Only because organized medicine refuses to accept his proofs, Miss Blaine. Marion, I don't think you want me to get well. Father! Even if this von Telberg is a quack, he's my last hope. I'm only 55 years old. A rich man. Someone's got to save me. I can't die. I can't. That may be. Come in. Dr. Von Telberg is here, Miss Blaine. Bring him in, Andrews. Bring him in. Yes, sir. Doctor? Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Foster Blaine, Dr. Von Telberg. This is my daughter. How do you do? You already know my private secretary, Homer Weldon. He tells me some wonderful things about you, Doctor. I hope to deserve his praise, sir. You wish to examine, Father. I'll leave you alone. Oh, please stay, Miss Blaine. An examination at this time is unnecessary. Mr. Weldon has provided me with your father's latest X-ray photographs, which I have carefully studied. Mr. Blaine, I can practically guarantee to restore you to health. You practically guarantee? Yes, but I will affect your cure only upon my own terms. If you can save me anything. Then when you will be removed to my private hospital this evening. No, I won't have it. So there can be no later question of our understanding. I have prepared this simple contract. You will please read and sign it, Mr. Blaine. Your daughter will sign too. I'll never sign You'll it. You'll do as I say. Very well. When this is signed, Miss Blaine, much will have been purchased. <laughs> Morning. Morning. I'm Casey, and this is Miss Williams. We're from the Morning Express. We have an appointment with Miss Blaine. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, will you please come in? Thank you. Right. 
Andrews, is that? It's the lady and gentleman from the newspaper, Miss Blaine. Miss Williams, I'm delighted to see you again. Hello, Miss Blaine. And Mr. Casey. It's very flattering to have you remember us. How could I ever forget you? If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have gotten back a lot of stolen jewelry several years ago. And to show my appreciation, I determined that you'd have the first and exclusive story about Dad. Well, we're certainly grateful. I'll say we are, and we're tickled that you have such a story to hand out. A miracle has happened, Mr. Casey. A perfect miracle. Your father's completely recovered? He's a new man. Six months ago, I... Well, as all of my friends know, I had no hope. I had no faith in Dr. Von Telberg, and... And thank heaven I was wrong. Wait till you see Father. <laughs> well, we're very happy for you, Miss Blaine. Come into the living room and sit down. Father and Dr. Von Telberg will join us. Andrews, ask them to come here, and Mr. Weldon. Very good, Miss Blaine. We've, uh... We've heard of this Dr. Hans von Telberg. He runs a little uh, private sanitarium out on the edge of town, doesn't he? Yes, you've probably heard, as I had, that other physicians consider him a quack. Well, frankly, that's the general impression. I believed him a charlatan at first. Oh, here's Father now. Father. Andrews just told us your friends were here. You remember Miss Williams and Mr. Casey? Oh, naturally. They did us a big favor once. It's nice to see both of you again. <sighs> Thanks, Mr. Blaine. Yeah. <laughs> you look at Dad as though you'd never seen him before. Well, it's been only two years since, but the change is astounding. You, you look like a new man, Mr. Blaine. <laughs> I've simply recovered my health. And here's the man who restored it to me. Miss Williams, Mr. Casey, Dr. Von Telberg. How do you do? <sighs> Doctor. Nice to know you. And you've met Homer Weldon, my secretary? At the time of the robbery, two years ago. Oh, yes, yeah. Glad to see you again, Weldon. So am I. Thank you. Now, I know you'll want to take pictures and hear the complete story of the great thing Dr. Von Telberg's done for me, so we're at your disposal. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Blaine, you know, the, the last time we saw you, you were, you were living on borrowed time. You looked it. The doctors told us what was wrong with you. And now... Well, I just can't get over this. <laughs> Neither can I, Casey. I've never believed in modern miracles before. Lanny, we're looking at one, I think. I don't know what's eating you, Casey. Gee whiz, doctors are making new discoveries every day. Uh, doctors like this von Telberg don't make a mental bit. Well, now, how can you say that, Casey, when we've seen the proof in Mr. Blaine's appearance? Uh, the thing just doesn't ring true, Annie, that's all. Blaine went into that hospital on his last legs and looking at least 70 years old, and he comes out a peppy guy of about 55. You're not playing with the idea that Von Telberg has rung in an imposter for Blaine, now, are you? Oh, you well. said his personal secretary and his own daughter accepted him as the real thing. Well, I... Well, the secretary was responsible for placing Blaine in Von Telberg's care, Ethelbert. And Marion Blaine wouldn't be too hard to fool because her father's cure... Well, that must be a wish fulfillment for her. What's known about this Dr. Von Telberg, Miss Williams? Well, very little. He's convinced the authorities that he's qualified to practice medicine, but most of his life has been spent in Germany. Yeah, it's pretty hard to check on a guy like that, too. Yeah, for my dough, he's a crook. And with the publicity he'll get out of Foster Blaine's cure, he stands to make a couple of million bucks, Ethelbert. With newspaper stiffs like Miss Williams and me helping him do it. But we've seen evidence of his cure, Casey. Well, he deserves the success we'll help bring him. Hmm, maybe. We'll see. Hello, Anne Williams speaking. This is Marion Blaine. Oh, Miss Blaine, how are you? I... I'm all right, thanks. And your father? He's... Just as you saw him last, a month ago. Oh, well, that's splendid. Miss Williams, I'd like to have a talk with you and with Mr. Casey. A confidential talk. Well, you sound upset. Is anything wrong? Uh, no. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. But can the two of you come to the house at 8.30 this evening? Well, yes. Uh, we'll be off duty then. I hope to be alone at that time, except for the servants. I'll expect you. Well, Miss Blaine, what is this all about? I can't tell you over the phone. I mustn't talk any more now. Please come. Goodbye. Well. Hmm. 
please come in. Thanks, Andrews. I'll tell Miss Blaine you are here. Oh, there she is now. Uh, Miss Williams and Mr. Mr. Casey, I, I, I'm so glad to see you. Uh, you may go, Andrews. Yes, Miss Blaine. Come with me. I'm going to take you two into the conservatory through here where we can be alone. Contrary to my expectations, Mr. Weldon is here tonight and... and father. What's this all about, Miss Blaine? Wait. Step in. Um, okay. Sit down while I close these doors. To say that you've aroused our curiosity would be an understatement, Miss Blaine. Yeah. Miss Williams, Mr. Casey, I'm afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what? Before I say what I'm compelled to say, I must be sure you will respect my confidence. I, I shan't be speaking for publication, at least not now. All right, it'll be off the record. Yes, of course. Thank you. I, I know how experienced you are with the criminal side of life. I know nobody else who can advise and... And help me. Go on. Mr. Casey, it's been a month since my... my father came home from Dr. Von Telberg's private hospital. You remember how happy I was to have him back, how, how convinced I was of the... the miracle that had apparently happened. Well, apparently? I use that word because... I've been thinking a great deal. You see, during the months father spent under Dr. Von Telberg's care, I was permitted to visit him for not more than five minutes each day... On most of those days, he never spoke to me because he was under the influence of drugs. And on none of those days was I able to really see him. What do you mean by that? His room was always kept dark. Dark? Well, exactly. What are you driving at, Miss Blaine? I'm beginning to wonder if the man Dr. Von Telberg brought to this house is really my father. What? Casey. Shh. Someone's outside that door. But he... Well... This is a pleasant surprise. Oh, uh, Mr. Blaine. I had no idea you had visitors, Marion. Nice to see you, Miss Williams. How are you, Casey? Very well, thanks. Come in, Weldon. Some old friends of ours are here. So I see. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Weldon. Hello. Weldon, uh, tell Andrews to bring drinks out here for all of us. Very well, Mr. Blaine. I hope we're not intruding, Marion. No, of course not. Father. <laughs> I was sure you'd make your old dad welcome. Were you in the midst of a conversation you wish to continue? If so, don't let me interrupt. We were merely talking about the weather. You two think Blaine was listening outside that conservatory door? We're sure of it, Captain. And that secretary, Weldon, was listening with him, Logan. Now, what happened after Blaine and Weldon joined you, Casey? They never left us until finally we had to leave them and go home. And this happened the night before last, yeah, huh? Uh, tell Logan about yesterday, Annie. Yeah, well, uh, I phoned Miss Blaine several times, but was unable to reach her until late afternoon. And then, well, she told me everything was all right and to forget the whole thing. Forget? She said all her doubts about Blaine had been settled. And she was reconvinced that he was her father. Yeah, which sounds to me as though some pressure had been brought to bear on her. Ah. Uh, well, it's an interesting story, but in case you've forgotten, this is the Homicide Bureau. What do you expect me to do about it? Prevent a possible homicide by putting Marion Blaine under protection. And investigate a possible homicide. Whose homicide? Well, if the present Foster Blaine is Im an imposter... What happened to the real one? Look, there's no evidence whatsoever that the present Foster Blaine is an imposter. Good Lord, Casey, the guy's accepted as the real McCoy by people who've known him for years. And what's more important, banks honor the checks that guy draws as Foster Blaine. Because of those checks, the bank honors. There's a couple of million bucks worth of reason for an imposter, Logan. Look, we know that nature never makes exact duplicates. Even twins are different. But everyone is resembled by hundreds of other people. Right. Given six months alone with two guys who are closely similar, a clever, unscrupulous surgeon could make one the image of the other. Uh, plastic surgery. Well, of course. And given six months of careful coaching by a confidential secretary, the imitator would be well able to pass as the real thing. Yeah, you two may have something after all. I want to have a good look at Mr. Foster Blaine. Now take a keen doctor with you, Logan. If any plastic work has been done, he'll know it. I'll take you... Excuse me. Homicide Bureau, Captain Logan speaking. Who? Yeah, I've got it. Go on. Well, keep everyone out of the room. Don't let anyone touch anything there. We'll be with you right away. Goodbye. Now, what was that, pal? What was that? 
I was talking to Miss Marion Blaine. Marion? Blaine. She's just found her father murdered. Her father? In the same room with his secretary, Weldon. He's an apparent suicide. <laughs> If you've been shopping recently in chain stores, department stores, hardware stores, or any other stores selling chinaware and glass, you undoubtedly have seen jadeite, the beautiful new kind of dinnerware developed by Anchor Hawking. Jadeite, spelled J-A-D-E-I-T-E, jadeite. As its name implies, it's jade green in color and has the lovely texture of fine old Chinese porcelain. But its appearance is deceptive, for jadeite is as sturdy and heat-proof as the fire king oven glass you use for baking. And here's the most amazing fact of all. Jadeite costs less than half as much as any other dinnerware you can buy. For instance, a jadeite cup and saucer costs only 15 cents. So why not add new interest to your dinner table by getting a jadeite dinner service this weekend? A complete 35-piece service for six costs less than $5. Beautiful, heat-proof jadeite is the newest triumph of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Yes, Miss Blaine, tell me what happened. When I came down to breakfast, Captain... I found Andrews, our butler, very worried. I... You tell him, Andrews? Yes, Miss Blaine. I had discovered that neither Mr. Blaine or Mr. Weldon had occupied their bedrooms last night, Captain. And one of the maids reported that the door of Mr. Blaine's study was locked from the inside and that no one answered her knock. I told Andrews to force the lock. When he did, we saw Father and, and Mr. Weldon. Oh, allow me, Miss Blaine. Everything was exactly as you found it on your arrival, Captain. Now, let's go back into that study, Casey, and hear what the M.E. has to say. Yeah. You better stay here with Miss Blaine, Annie. Yeah, okay. Now, what's the word, Doc? It looks like murder and suicide, Captain. Blaine was shot twice in the chest from a distance. Weldon has a single bullet through the temple. and The gun muzzle was held only a few inches away. What time did the two guys die? What, well, about 2 o'clock this morning. Uh, the rest of the house is asleep upstairs. These walls are thick. The shots wouldn't be heard. Doc. Uh, yes, Casey? Did you examine Blaine's face? Thoroughly. No plastic surgery was performed on the man. There isn't the slightest indication of it. Huh. Another of your big ideas gone haywire, pal. And how? Uh, now, why should Weldon kill his boss and then do a Harry Carey? Well, that's for you cops to figure out. I haven't even a haywire idea. <laughs> What have the cops figured out about that murder and suicide, Casey? Now, that secretary Weldon had banked a lot of dough, Ethelbert, over 100,000 bucks during the time that Blaine was in Von Telberg's private hospital. Apparently, Blaine got wise that Weldon had been robbing him and accused him of it. And then Weldon got desperate and shot Blaine and, well, then himself. That's the way it looks. You mean and you don't believe it's the way it looks? Oh, I don't know, pal. I'm, I'm trying hard not to get another big idea that'll go haywire. But Miss Williams and I got a report on the autopsy a little while ago, and, well, it just doesn't add up right. What do you mean? Well, the autopsy revealed that Blaine was organically sound. There wasn't even a trace of the disease that was killing him before he went to Von Telberg's. Oh, then the guy really performed a miracle on him. That's the way it looks. Oh, again, huh? Yeah, yeah. What are you going to do about it? Why? As newspaper stiffs, we'll, we'll report the findings. They'll be published. Poor sick souls from all over the world will flock to Von Telberg and beg him to take their dough. And I'll tell you right now, Ethelbert, when I see that happen, I'm going to quit the newspaper business. And so am I. Come on, Casey, let's get out of here. Well, why get out of here? You ain't sore at me, are you? Oh, no, of course not, Ethelbert. We're simply going to cheer ourselves up by going to the undertakers. By going to... Huh? Foster Blaine's body has been turned over to the embalmers. It'll be laid out in one of their rooms tonight. And, well, we figure that... Marion Blaine will be there won't be easy for her to take. She's been nice to us, and she trusts us, so... Well, maybe it'll help her if we're around, you know. Well, so long, pal. Good night. Good night. Such places they go to. Undertakers. 
I'm very glad you came here, Anne, and you, Mr. Casey. I'm glad we're welcome, Marion. Yes. They... They made Father look very natural, didn't they? I just don't know how I could have ever doubted he was my father. Say, wait a minute. What, Casey? What? I just noticed something that... Miss Blaine, your, your father was almost bald in front. He had only a thin line of hair on his forehead that he brushed back in an attempt to cover his bald spot. Why, yes, they're brushed that way now. Yeah, but these few brushed back hairs don't cover a bald spot. Of course they do. Well, they don't. There's a thick stubble there. This spot has been kept shaved. Von Telberg found a man so like your father, he could be mistaken for him, Miss Blaine, if he was as bald as your father was. Oh, no, I won't believe the it. The cops will when I show them this. I'm going to phone Logan right away. Wait. What? What's the matter? If the man in this coffin was an imposter, Von Telberg is responsible. Von Telberg killed my real father. I'm afraid so. Then Dr. Von Telberg owes me a life for a life. The cops will make him pay. Oh, no. I'll make him pay. Huh? And you won't stop me. Larry! You, you carry a gun, I see. I've always carried it for my own protection. But now it'll be used for something else. Well, why point it at us? I'm not going to let anyone interfere with what I mean to do. My car's in front of this place. Anne, you'll drive, and Mr. Casey will sit with you. If you follow directions, you'll be in no danger. Come on. We're going to call on Von Telberg. There's his house, Anne. Stop in front. All right, Marion. Mind if I tell you again, Marion? You're acting very foolishly. I tell you again, Mr. Casey, that I'm the best judge of that. Now, get out. I'll be holding this gun under my coat. Oh, I hate to threaten you two this way. You know I don't want to harm you, but I... I'm determined to make that man tell me what he did with my father. And then, after I've paid him, you can turn me over to the police. Ring that doorbell, Anne. All right. He lives alone here, so he'll answer the bell. Follow my lead, and no warnings. You're the boss, lady. Casey, what? Miss Blaine. Good evening, doctor. And Miss Williams and Mr. Casey. Uh, this is most unexpected. Are you alone? Yes. We'd like to come in. Of course. Ladies first, Annie and Miss Blaine. Thank you. Oh. Uh, habits are hard to break, aren't they, Miss Blaine? You shouldn't have acted the lady and let me get behind you. You've got her gun, Casey. Oh. Yes, I've got her gun. Close the door, Annie. Yeah. What, what is the meaning of this? That's something you two murderers are going to tell us. What, two murderers? Yes, Anne. Marion Blaine is number one, and this guy is only a stooge. You're mad. Oh, no, no. I had time to do a whole lot of thinking during our trip out here, Miss Blaine. I have a hunch Von Telberg will straighten out everything when he realizes you came here to kill him. That's a lie, Doctor. Listen, Von Telberg. She knew we discovered that the dead Foster Blaine was a phony. So she brought us here at the point of a gun. Now, why do you think she did that? But I... I do not know. Well, can't you figure it? The phony Foster Blaine was apparently murdered by a guy who apparently committed suicide. If Miss Williams and I were found shot to death in your house and you were an apparent suicide... I see. No, no, doctor, I swear. So I too was to be destroyed, Miss Blaine. Don't talk, you fool, don't. Yeah, I talk to save myself and to pay you. Doctor! I am no murderer. The worst I did was to put a living man in the place of a dying man no one could save. And it was your idea, Miss Blaine. You supplied the substitute in your father's twin brother. Twin brother? You may as well take it from there, Miss Blaine. Yes, yes, I may as well. Nobody but father and I knew he had a twin because his twin ran off with my mother when I was a child. He hated me because I was the one person who knew about his disgrace and because I was like my mother. He hated me so much that in his will he left me only the legal minimum. Well, 
He taught me to hate, too. So when I learned the whereabouts of his twin brother... He cooked up a big idea with the help of Weldon and Von Telberg. Yes. Father died, and his twin brother, George, took his place. George had promised to change Father's will in my favor. Yeah, but when he found himself in the driver's seat, he didn't do it. You had to force his hand by getting Miss Williams and me to the house, where she knew he'd be listening. And she hinted about exposing him. He made the will in your favor the next day, didn't he, Miss Blaine? Yes. Well, how did you make it look as though Weldon had killed him and then committed suicide? That was very easy. Weldon was in love with me. After you shot your father's twin, you... I kissed Weldon as I put the gun against his head. Oh, no. Why not? My father gave me nothing but hatred for no fault of mine. Why should a woman return to men better than she receives? Annie, phone for the cops. We'll join the crowd of the Blue Note in just a moment. This year, America, the land of plenty, is sharing with the world one of the most serious food crises in history. If it were not for the food packers of America, in convention this week at Atlantic City, this crisis would be far greater than it is. For the food packers of America take each food crop as it ripens and becomes ready for market, products of field and orchard and stream, and preserve them for your use throughout the year. If it were not for the magnificent efficiency of our food packers, much of the food produced in America would be wasted and would never reach the market. As it is, even in this year of food shortages, it is possible for you to enjoy varied and healthful meals throughout the year. Anchor Hawking is proud to be associated with the food packers of America and to be privileged to supply so many of the glass containers and easy-to-open caps which bring you the better brands of food. Anchor glass containers and tamper-proof anchor caps are products of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Gee, I hope I never meet up with a gal like that Marion Blaine case. Yeah, well, it's an experience I don't want again, Ethel. Yeah, make that a double. How's that Dr. Von Telberg gonna stand when a trial comes off? Well, he won't go on trial as a doctor, Ethelbert. He's admitted his credentials were stolen from a real doctor who died in the German prison camp where this egg, whose real name, I think, is something like Fritz Pumpernickel, was just a hospital orderly. Gee, the things that happen after wars. <sighs> yeah. Casey, the room where Blaine and Weldon were shot was locked from inside. How... A pair of eyebrow tweezers can be used to turn the key of an old-fashioned lock through the keyhole, pal. Oh... Don't get any you're... ideas. Huh? Yeah, it's clever, that, Miss Blaine. Yeah. I guess there's such a thing as being too clever. Yeah. 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 Say, this conversation is getting dull, isn't it? Prime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass, Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. is directed by John Deeks. The original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. Herman Chittison is the Blue Note pianist. This is Tony Marvin saying good night for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.